start our program now. We want to welcome you to the Zoom program tonight. Uh, my name is Maggie and I'm one of the reference librarians uh, here at the Troy Public Library. Uh, we want to thank the Friends of the Library for sponsoring this program and without them uh, we wouldn't be able to have uh, programs like this with Steve presenting some great information. Uh, before we start, I want to let you know that after uh, you exit from this Zoom program, you should see a survey and if you could fill it out, we would really appreciate it as um, you know, we get ideas for you of what other programs we can get. So that would be wonderful. Also tonight, um, Steve will begin and do his presentation, but if you have questions, please put them down at the bottom of the Q&A. And at the end of the program, I'll read those questions uh, to Steve and he can answer them. Um, we're real excited to have Steve back. You know, Steve is our military historian and he's done some really great presentations. Uh, some of them were on D-Day, Battle of the Bulge, um, and not to mention, um, there was another one about the war in uh, the Mediterranean. But today he's gonna talk about the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, which was 45 years ago, can you believe it? So I'm gonna hand this over to Steve now. And again, I will be coming back at the end of the program. If you have any questions, put those down at the bottom of the Q&A, and then we'll read those um, to Steve at the end of the program. All right, Steve. Thanks, Maggie. Uh Good evening, everybody. Uh, hope you're having a great day. And it's kind of gloomy outside and that's basically what you expect in November. And, and it's kind of appropriate uh, that we would uh, have this type of story uh, and we'll accommodating weather too. Well, uh, first of all, let me talk about the Great Lakes a little bit. Right here is, uh, the largest body of fresh water in the world, uh, over 22% of all the fresh water is right here and we're right in the middle of it. Very easy to see where we're at. Uh, the lakes are divided into two sections. You have the upper lakes, which is Superior, uh, Michigan and Huron, and the lower lakes, uh, you have Erie and Ontario. And in this map here, you can see the waterway uh, the St. Lawrence uh, working its way to the east and over to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so it's uh, a remarkable place and I'm sure, you know, most of you have been able to wander around and explore the, the region. And um, over the years, the uh, shipping has been a very vital part to the development, economic development of uh, the region and uh, being able to move resources from one point to the next. And uh, one vital part of that is uh, the steel industry, which uh, exists down in Indiana, the southern part of Lake Michigan. Uh, and then on the eastern end of the Huron uh, side, we go through uh, Detroit and in the northern part of Ohio, uh, branching off into Pennsylvania. So uh, getting the resources from one point to the other is, uh, is a critical point. And ever since the 1800s, uh, shipping has been uh, critical to the uh, uh, development of uh, the region. One, take, one lake in particular we're gonna be focusing on, and that one is, that's right, Lake Superior. Uh, this is the largest of the Great Lakes. And uh, the deepest part of uh, Lake Superior is 1,332 feet. And it's quite an expanse. Uh, um, I was always brought up to, to look at Lake Superior as a uh, head of a wolf. The Keweenaw Peninsula being the mouth of the wolf. Isle Royal is the eye of the wolf. And the tip of the nose is Duluth, Minnesota. And then you can see the rest of it. And uh, the neck areas where uh, Whitefish Bay is, where it inks, uh, works its way down through the, um, the Sioux Locks over to uh, uh, the northern part of Lake Huron. Um, actually, Lake uh, Superior is 
is 18 feet higher than the rest of the lakes. And, and that's because, uh, because of that is why they have the locks built at uh, Sault Ste. Marie. Well, there's uh, typically in November, the, you, they uh, call it the storm season, you know, something's going to happen and uh, it's been happening already in, uh, in the Great Lakes. Uh, a lot of big storms have been uh, uh, beating the ships up a little bit, but uh, they're, they're making it. Uh, we haven't had any problems, but uh, um, I'm going to talk about one ship in particular. There's uh, an estimated 6,000 ships that have been lost on the Great Lakes but there's only one that people can identify with or remember, and that is the Fitzgerald. Uh, this picture here shows uh, hall number 301, which uh, at Great Lakes Engineering Works in River Rouge, uh, just south of Detroit. And uh, you look at the date at the top of the picture, it is November 29th, 1957. And uh, this is the Fitzgerald in its very early stages of construction. And this is uh, what the cargo holds look like. The Fitz was, uh, when it was built, was the largest ship to be built on the Great Lakes, uh, 729 feet. And is also the first ship to be built in modular sections. Uh, instead of laying the keel and building it up from there, they uh, built the, this ship in a new construction method where they would uh, have at, at different locations these sections built and uh, assembling them in the docks. So here we are at the early part of the, this is the Fitzgerald. This is when it was launched on uh, June 7th, uh, 1958. And uh, the, the whole ship is not completed at this point, but the hull is. Uh, the engines and the anchors have not been attached yet. And the, uh, the boat itself uh, would slide sideways into a, uh, uh, a basin uh, connecting to the Detroit River. And actually this basin is still there. You can still check it. So it's part of what's called Nicholson Terminal. Um, since uh, Great Lakes Engineering Works went uh, out of business, but you can still visit the site. It's kind of interesting to see. Um, I rarely, people rarely ask this question, but uh, you know, people say, "Well, who who was Edmund Fitzgerald? What well, you know, who got who was this guy that they got a ship named after?" And this picture here isn't good enough to be able to see on the back of the ship, which says Edmund Fitzgerald. Right below it, it says Milwaukee, and. Uh, the Edmund Fitzgerald was a uh, was the chairman of an insurance company based in Wisconsin, and they uh, had the ship built as a uh, investment venture, and they leased it to uh, Columbia Transportation Company, who uh, the, the ship sailed under uh, under their name. And that's who Edmund Fitzgerald is. And the Fitz says itself, at that point out earlier, was the largest ship on, built on the Great Lakes at that time, uh, 729 feet and 75 feet wide. And this is a side view of the ship. By, uh, it's built in the typical Great Lakes uh, style where you had up forward, you had the uh, pilot house, uh, the captain's quarters, the radio room. Uh, the windless uh, area, whether that's windless, it deals with the anchors. Uh, um, you didn't have too much up front. That was the command and control center. And, but in the stern, that's where everything else was located. Not only the engine room, but the cruise quarters, the galley, a little machine shop back in there too. Um, and on this particular side view of the ship, if you look at the smokestack, uh, in the stern section and you'd see a yellow band with a red star with a C in it for Columbia. And Columbia Transportation Company uh, had a, quite a large fleet at that time. And uh, they were based out of Cleveland, Cleveland, Ohio. The 
Fitz uh, had broken a lot of records in shipping. A lot of it was breaking its own records because uh, it was rather uh, quick, uh, fast. It could Fitzgerald could uh, make you about 16 knots, which was uh, pretty good, uh, very good uh, for its time. And uh, it can move uh, a lot of iron ore, uh, taconite uh, from Duluth all the way down to the steel mills, mostly in uh, Detroit and northern part of Ohio. Here's a picture of the Fitz under sail going through the St. Mary's River, uh, not too far from Sault Ste. Marie. And you can see she's riding low in the water. The anchors are pretty close to the water level. And that's an indication that she's carrying a cargo. She was rated at 26,000 tons uh, capacity, which back then was pretty good. Now you have uh, 1,000 footers that can haul uh, 60, 65,000 tons uh, with no problem. But uh, this is an interesting picture here because you can see uh, on the right above the pilot house, the ship's mast, you can see the radar array up on top. And uh, you can see the, uh, the colors of the, the flags of the um, Columbia Transportation Company and the ship's colors. It's, there, it's a white triangle with the blue borders on the top and bottom and red letters saying Edmund Fitzgerald. It's interesting to, to be able to see it from this perspective. You'll see it from another perspective uh, later on in the program. As I alluded to, uh, November is notorious for uh, the storm systems. You have uh, the cold air from the north coming down and uh, you have uh, warm air from the south coming up. And uh, on the night of November 10th, 1975, you had these, this low pressure area that was moving um, north. And uh, it uh, was about to, a storm was about to explode over Lake Superior. And uh, what's interesting to note is that the Fitz was at this time, it originated uh, from Duluth, Minnesota, and they knew a storm was coming. Yeah, they looked at their charts and they could weather charts and they can see what was happening. And a little further up the coast was another port where you can load up with uh, iron ore. It's called Two Harbors. And there was another ship there that was waiting to load up too. Uh, it's called the Arthur M. Anderson. And ironically enough, uh, the Anderson was 40 feet longer than the Fitzgerald, having been extended a process of opening the ship up and putting a 120 foot section in it to open it up and, and kind of make it uh, longer so that it can carry more cargo. And uh, Captain Cooper, Bernie Cooper was uh, the master of that boat and, and both him and Captain McSorley were, uh, were looking at the charts and uh, they were trying to uh, get a good grasp of the situation before they set sail. And the plan was for both ships to sail as far north as possible. Uh, you're going to have high winds uh, coming out of the northwest. Uh, they were going to be going eventually to 60, 65 miles an hour with gusts over 70 miles an hour. And by staying further to the north, just under Isle Royal, uh, the, the storm wouldn't have a chance to really uh, make the seas worse than they actually would be. And when they uh, left port um, earlier that day, it was uh, nice and sunny. Nothing like uh, uh, would you actually evolve and transpire later on. And they, uh, by the time they got over to Isle Royal, that's when the storm started to uh, develop and, and intensify. Yeah, the Fitz uh, had a carrying capacity of 31,000 tons, but uh, it, it rarely did that. But here you see the owner, uh, Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company. 
and the operator o Ogilvy Norton, Columbia Transportation Company was a subsidiary of Ogilvy Norton. This uh, shows uh, the black line would be uh, pretty much what the um, Anderson would sail and the red of that of course was the Fitzgerald trying to stay as far north as possible. Things were going okay. They were, yeah, they were enduring the storm, uh, but it wasn't until then an upper uh, northern section of this route here that the, uh, the northeast section of Lake Superior that this, the winds had succeeded in knocking out the radar on the Fitzgerald. There were two radar units and both of them were inoperable. And with waves 20 to 30 feet high, that can be a very serious problem. You had, uh, with, uh, you had no peripheral vision. You couldn't see the horizon, not knowing where you're going, just going off of compass bearings. And, and that can be kind of difficult, be very dangerous. So it was at this particular point that the uh, McSorley contacted uh, the Anderson and asked for assistance. And the Anderson, I uh, was happy to oblige. And that meant that the Fitzgerald would have to slow down. The Anderson, the best the Anderson can do is 14 and a half knots, whereas the Fitzgerald can do 16. And it had to just check down the speed a little bit so that the uh, Fitzgerald would, the distance between the Fitzgerald and the Anderson would close. And it wasn't until about 10 miles out from the Anderson that the uh, Fitzgerald would begin to show up on their radar. And with that assistance, they would be able to direct the Fitzgerald, giving them their, um, their course heading so that they could navigate uh, the rest of the trip down toward uh, Whitefish Bay and to uh, the Sault Ste. Marie. And a particular interest over here and geographically speaking, would be the uh, that green spot over on the east end of the map here, and that's uh, Michigan Island. And a little bit below it is another island that's uh, it's known as Caribou Island. And what's going to play particularly uh, um, important uh, in this story is uh, the there's a a shoals, a shallow area just north of uh, Caribou Island, and that's a uh, uh, place called Six Fathom Shoals. And uh, Six Fathoms is 36 feet, there's six feet in a fathom. But uh, on all the charts, that sh shoal area is listed as 23 feet, and that's what's going to create some problems later on. The Arthur M. Anderson uh, worked for U.S. Steel and um, built in 1952. And as I pointed out, she was uh, extended and stretched out to 767 feet. And uh, actually she's still sailing, you know, it's, uh, this is an older picture. I, is what's referred to as a straight deck freighter. There's a very a typical construction for a, a Great Lakes boat. Um, was later on what they did is they uh, started uh, the boats now are, are called uh, self unloaders and you have a boom on the deck that's approximately 250 feet long and this boom can uh, swing either 90 degrees either port or starboard and uh, the cargo would fall down onto a conveyor belt and be able to go um, uh, either fore or aft wherever how they depending how they had that uh, boom situated and be able to unload itself. Um, so this is it, this is an early picture before the Anderson was converted to a, a self unloader. And it was probably about a month ago that I, uh, I saw the Anderson come by the Fitch, uh, by the Dawson Great Lakes Museum. That's where I work. And uh, the Anderson was coming up. Or, or actually, was going down at this point, heading down toward. Um, out of Lake St. Clair and heading toward uh, Lake Erie. And every time the Anderson comes by the Dawson Great Lakes Museum, they salute um, uh, three long and two short. And that's, uh, that's in salute of the, uh, that particular night on November 10, 75, uh, when all three ships were together. 
those, those three ships being the Fitzgerald, of course, uh, the William Clay Ford, which was an at anchor in Whitefish Bay, and uh, of course the Arthur M. Anderson. Uh, this is the Dawson Great Lakes Museum is the only place where you can have all three ships together um, at one time. We have the anchor from the Fitzgerald and the pilot house of the William Clay Ford. We'll talk about that later. As the storm began to intensify, I, there's a, a, a phenomenon called green water. It's where the actually, the water just washes uh, um, across the spar deck of the, of the freighters. And uh, it gets really, uh, precarious. These boats, they're not stiff. They give a little bit. And uh, mariners I've talked with had told me that, you know, they can actually see the boat twisting and turning in the, in the high winds. And uh, that no doubt was the situation with the uh, Fitzgerald. Here she has her running lights on, which makes it easier uh, for the, uh, the Anderson to see her but it's a standard procedure to have your running lights on. And uh, as I pointed out, the waves were 20, 30 feet high and the boat coming down into it, um, water would uh, come awash um, at the, pretty much the top of the, uh, the bow uh, over here. And then the boat being buoyant enough to be able to, to rise back up. Um, It was uh, coming down from, uh, well, if, let me preface everything right now by saying that no one really knows exactly why the Fitzgerald sank. Uh, the, there's no survivors in the crew, all 29 lost their lives, but there's a series of events that, in, that occurred and uh, there's recordings of radio messages and um, all that particular helps us out to be able to understand what happened that night. And uh, as I pointed out, the Fitzgerald had to be able to navigate between uh, the, the two islands on the eastern part of the lake, the, the large one, Michicotten, and then Caribou Island. And the Fitz um, was, was given a course and headings but uh, was drifting a lot, pretty close over to uh, the Shoals area. And it was Captain uh, Bernie Cooper on the Anderson who actually said on the radio, well, that's a lot closer than I'd want to be in reference to the position of the Fitzgerald uh, to the Shoals. And, uh, you know, it, they're, they're rated at being 23 feet deep, but uh, with waves that high, you know, the swells will bring that down closer probably to 18 feet and a fully loaded freighter like the Edmund Fitzgerald is gonna draw about 25 feet of water. So I think you can begin to see what some of the problems are. And uh, although there was no radio recording of the Fitzgerald hitting anything, it's quite possible that because of the intensity of the storm that uh, they may have hit the shoals. I preface that with saying they may have since we don't know. And as the boat uh, continued on, it began to have problems. There was a, uh, a saltwater boat that was leaving Whitefish Bay a little bit later on. And it was, uh, had a pilot, American pilot on board who in conversation with McSorley was trying to find out more about the conditions uh, later further out into the, uh, into the lake. In the course of that conversation, Captain McSorley mentioned that he had a bad list to starboard and it incidentally probably would have been the starboard side that would have hit the shoals. And he mentioned he had both pumps going. There's two types of pumps on board the boat and uh, he had all of them going. So they, was, they can pump up approximately 800 gallons of water a minute. In spite of all of that, the boat had a a list to starboard. And the very last thing we ever hear from the Edmund Fitzgerald is that they're holding their own. And uh, that doesn't seem to stress any concern or uh, project any urgency or, or, or danger or, or anything. And feeling that they're very confident that they will get through this and 
make it to Whitefish Bay. Well, that's not what happened. Now, there's a, a series of waves that come into the story too, or rogue waves as they're referred to. And these were mentioned by Cooper on the Anderson, which in this case was uh, sailing behind approximately 10 miles behind the uh, Fitzgerald. And he mentions that the, uh, the Anderson was hit in rapid succession by three really big waves that were about the, uh, he, he mentioned about the uh, lifeboats, where the lifeboats are. And these waves uh, would continue on down southward and toward the Fitzgerald. And one of the bits of information that uh, Cooper contributed to the investigation was the fact that these waves, they hit him, hit the Anderson and, and would continue down range to be able to, uh, to batter the uh, Fitzgerald. And if, you know, the Fitzgerald not having radar um, and also in having to go slower and then also being crippled perhaps by the, uh, by bottoming out over at, at uh, Six Fathom Shoals, it's quite possible that these waves could have pushed the bow down. It would have been the bow section that would have been heavier than the stern section. And it's believed that uh, in, the, in this series of events that this is what happened. And this drawing here shows exactly what, uh, what that could have, how that would have transpired. Uh, the, it's, it's a known fact that the Fitzgerald did not break up in half. It's in two pieces. Uh, it did not break up on the surface. And it's believed that she was pushed down by these waves and uh, began to uh, fill up with water and the bow section becoming he much heavier than the stern section and the shifting of cargo. And uh, the stress point would be midship there in the middle and that's where she broke up. What happened is the bow section was, uh, it's, it, it, it's 276 feet long and that's separated from the rest of the ship and approximately 200 feet of the center section broke up in smaller pieces. And uh, it's known uh, that there's a large debris field down there with fragments from the midship section of the boat and the remains of the cargo. Uh, the, Stern section followed the rest of the boat. The, the screw was still turning and uh, the torque from the screw caused the uh, stern section to uh, rotate and uh, become inverted. And, and that's where how she's resting on the bottom, this particular point. So uh, this is uh, pretty much how everyone feels that uh, the wreck developed. The bow section came down and, and hit really hard. Uh, they estimate that the section, uh, the bow section hit at approximately, based on the damage, the extensive damage to the ship, they believe she hit at about 30 miles an hour. It's a bedrock uh, on the bottom of, of Lake Superior in that location. The uh, midship section is scattered throughout and uh, the hatch covers are blown off. Um, you can see the, the bow section being badly damaged and, and uh, the hull just, just crushed. Uh, that's from the collision. But uh, in the course of the investigation, it was not uh, easy to determine what was caused from the storm and what was actually caused from the, the actual sinking of the ship. And it became very difficult to be able to uh, pinpoint any particular causes. The stern section is laying totally inverted, um, 170 feet apart from the uh, from the bow, and uh, you, that's where the the crew is located. That's where most of the uh, the crew would be located inside there. And it's very dark. The uh, water temperature down there is just above freezing, between 34 and 36 degrees and no ambient light whatsoever. When the boat broke up um, and began to go down, 
there was uh, a lot of debris, your, your life rings, which are, they're, they're placed on a hook so that they can be used readily. They're not secured down. Um, there was some wood that broke free and, and came to the surface. Um, and of course, uh, you, you can, there's two locations where you can see the, the two lifeboats. These lifeboats, uh, number one and number two, were uh, located on davits in the stern section of the boat. And uh, it, they were covered with a canvas uh, to protect the life support equipment and supplies that are inside the boat, uh, food, water, flares, things of that nature. And so when the, uh, the stern section started to go under, air was trapped in, uh, in under the canvas of these lifeboats and they were turned and became inverted and, and eventually broke free and uh, came to the surface. And this is one of them right here. One of them, uh, one of the lifeboats is at the uh, Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum at Whitefish Point. And the other one is over at the Valley Camp, which is a, a ship museum located in Sault Ste. Marie. There have been a total of nine expeditions uh, on the wreck itself to be able to investigate it and trying to discern uh, what actually caused the boat to sink and go down. Every single one of them has been inconclusive. Uh, the first one was conducted by the United States Navy. They had a, it was in May of uh, 1976 that a naval vessel entered the Great Lakes and uh, went to the location where the Fitzgerald had sunk. And using sonar, they're able to vector their camera, tethered camera into the area. And they were the first to, uh, to identify the wreckage uh, as positively identifying it as that of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, subsequently, there have been you know, other investigations, one of which was uh, Jacques Cousteau, who, who uh, um, I think more or less for publicity purposes, uh, explored the wreck. And he mentioned that it was, uh, uh, it broke on the surface and it was pretty quickly pointed out that that's, that wasn't the case. And uh, uh, never came back. The last expedition was to remove the bell on the top of the pilot house is a, the ship's bell, which would have the name of the boat on it. And uh, usually they have the name of, or the, uh, the year the ship was built in some cases. And so uh, the families were really concerned. Uh, there have been these expeditions on the wreck. Uh, every, uh, every single one of them has been inconclusive. Uh, no evidence of, the crew, of any of the crew members have been discovered. Um, and according to Gordon Lightfoot's song, uh, you know, the, the lake never gives up her dead. And that's partially to the point where, or, or because of the, uh, the cold temperatures, anyone ever gone swimming in Lake Superior, even if you're there in July or August, you know, that it's, it's, it's cold. You're not going to spend much time in the water and uh, you're going to be coming out in a hurry. But uh, this cold temperature kind of prevents the, any, uh, of, of the bodies from coming to the surface. So they, they pretty they would be staying down there at the bottom. After the ninth and final expedition at the request of the families, the uh, um, Canadian uh, government uh, would not grant any further permits for exploration. The, the Edmund Fitzgerald is sitting in, in Canadian waters uh, uh, in uh, just north of Whitefish Bay. It's actually 17 miles north, northeast of Whitefish Point and approximately 12 miles west of Coppermine Point, which is in Canada. And uh, technically 529 feet of water is way at the bottom. When they, uh, First uh, expedition on the wreck came up with some of these photographs. Uh, this is probably one of the first uh, early images that came up on the, on the video screen. 
Um, it, without doubt, it's uh, this turns out to be the port side of the Edmund Fitzgerald bomb. And you can see the extensive damage uh, to the ship from the collision. The camera came up, rose up from the, the side of the ship and uh, was a, uh, attempting to explore the pilot house, uh, the command and control center of the ship. And they shined their lights into it and real, uh, discovered that all of the windows in the pilot house were blown out. They're not there. And everything was open. And as they shined their lights inside, it was kind of gave a very eerie uh, image to the uh, of the interior there because there there was a number of crew members that were there but they're they're not there now and then the camera began to move across toward the center of the pilot house and looking into it and that's what we're looking at right now this is the uh, the, the forward section to the front of the pilot house and uh, you can see that big crease in the pilot house there and that's just uh, that testimony to the to the force of what you hit the bottom of Lake Superior. The little device a little bit over to the, uh, the right there is a, it's a compass, another compass, that one being on the outside. So if you're outside of the pilot house, you can still uh, see the, uh, the compass bearings. What's of particular interest here is those straps hanging from the top of the window in the center. And those are uh, connected to a life jacket. The life jacket uh, is floating uh, on the top of the, uh, of the pilot house. And it's evident that someone had went and, and reached for a life jacket to put it on at the last minute, uh, but wasn't able to. And uh, was washed clear of the, uh, of the pilot house. But it's, uh, it's kind of an eerie uh, image in my eye is probably one of the most uh, sobering uh, images uh, about the wreck. This is the uh, on the side of the ship over on the starboard side. Um, and of course, uh, the name Edmund Fitzgerald is clear. There's a lot of uh, uh, debris that's circulating throughout the, uh, the boat. And of course, uh, the UA, uh, UAVs are, are moving around there and it's kind of stirring up things a little bit. One thing that's uh, well, a place just nearby that you can visit is the Dawson Great Lakes Museum. And this is the starboard bow anchor of the Fitzgerald. But there's more to the story. So uh, it was not taken from the wreckage of the ship. It was in January of 1974, the Fitzgerald fully loaded was heading down on, on the Detroit River past uh, Belle Isle and uh, was gonna be pulling up. Uh, and there's an anchorage area about a mile west of the island. And the uh, Fitzgerald was gonna stop for the night and had to come about and once facing into the current and was, then was able to put down her two, two bow anchors the port and starboard anchor. And when the starboard anchor hit the bottom, which is only about 30 feet deep uh, at that location, uh, it unhooked. Now there's a device called a master link that hooks around the anchor chain and then across that shackle at the end of the shank there on the anchor. And it's held, once that's connected, there's a, uh, a locking element that fits in there and a bolt that holds it all together, a non-load bearing bolt. Well, something happened to that bolt and that came off or something, uh, no one knows, uh, but the locking element fell away. But this anchor weighs 12,290 pounds. It's a little over six tons. So that's a sufficient att uh, tension on the uh, anchor chain to prevent the anchor from going anywhere. But upon lowering the anchor and, and uh, allowing the tension to uh, dissipate it just the anchor and hooked. So this is January, mind you. And so you've got ice uh, floating down from Lake St. Clair. Suzanne Ryan. And uh, it's a, um, uh, uh, 
the diver, the commercial diver that was uh, uh, hired to reconnect the anchor had, uh, had to dodge a lot of ice and actually was trapped underneath his dive boat for approximately 15 minutes. And uh, being able to find sufficient uh, I, uh, hole in the surface where he'd be able to get out. And at that point, he said, ah, I'm not doing this anymore. Nah, I changed my mind, I'm not gonna do it. So McSorley uh, had uh, discovered that uh, uh, he had lost an anchor. And that was the end of that. And there's, by the way, there's three anchors on the ship, the port starboard bow anchors, and there's one in the stern there as well. So he notified the company, uh, Columbia Transportation Company, that he had lost his, uh, his anchor and that they would make arrangements to get another one. And it's that replacement anchor that ended up um, at the bottom of Lake Superior. Uh, this particular anchor is March, where it was manufactured in uh, July of 1957. And uh, shortly after the Fitzgerald was built that it uh, was attached to the, uh, to the ship itself. It was recovered, actually it was recovered in 1992, but uh, one of the staff people came across a little sidebar story about the Fitzgerald losing an anchor in the Detroit River. And at the time she lost the anchor, it was no big deal. Uh, well, I guess it was a big deal, but uh, the Fitzgerald would, had not gained uh, legendary notoriety at that point. It hadn't sunk. Um, and that was the end of the story. You know, there's an anchor at the bottom of the Detroit River. There's a lot of other strange things at the bottom of the river as well. But uh, this being one that was, uh, that caught our attention. And this is approximately 18 years after the Fitzgerald was lost. And we began to look for it. According to the company's logs, their records, the, Fitz, the Fitzgerald lost this anchor. They gave a latitude and longitude of where the anchor was supposed to be. And of course, it wasn't there. <laughs> so uh, using a, a magnetometer that was dragged behind a, a, a boat back and forth through the, uh, the anchorage area, eventually, uh, they came across a number of, of hits uh, of likely uh, targets. And those were, we started diving on those uh, the next day and uh, finally we came across the anchor. We proceeded to raise money. And uh, in 1992, there was a program on WDIV called Live Dive. It was a whole hour long program about the recovery of the Fitzgerald and a story of the Fitzgerald. and. Um, it was, it was, from what we understand, uh, it was one of the, uh, the most watched uh, productions of, in that time period. And uh, there was a weatherman you may know, his name is Mel Sillers, and he was uh, a master diver. And he actually did a live broadcast from the bottom of the Detroit River uh, when, when the anchor was coming up. And, uh, and there's the anchor before you. This is the largest piece of the Edmund Fitzgerald above water. And uh, it's, it can be seen uh, uh, anytime you want. Just, uh, uh, the museum, Dawson Gray Lakes Museum is open every Friday, Saturday and Sunday from 10 o'clock to, to five o'clock in the evening. And uh, there also is the pilot house from the William Clay Ford, which the William Clay Ford was in Whitefish Bay, about two miles west of La Prisian Island. And um, when it was determined that the Fitzgerald was, may have, uh, that it did sink, that they uh, uh, had asked, the commander of the Coast Guard station at Sault Ste. Marie had asked if the uh, captains uh, of the two boats, the Anderson and the, and the William Clay, if, uh, prefaced everything with, if, if it would not endanger the ship or crew, uh, if they would uh, agree to go out into the storm and see if uh, there was anything, uh, any survivors that may have gotten off the ship. The only search and rescue assets that the Coast Guard had were way over on the west end of the river over in uh, Duluth. And that was where the uh, wood rush was. The wood rush, uh, they had a, a instant recall for the crew and they were able to get underway in about a half an hour. But even in good weather, it would take about 12 hours to get from Duluth, Minnesota to Whitefish Bay. So 
So even though they got underway, you know, it wouldn't help anyone. The water is extremely cold, as we talked about earlier. And uh, any crew member that may have gotten off and been in the water, your life expectancy is going to be about 15 minutes before you succumb to uh, hypothermia and, uh, and drown. So the, uh, the Anderson came about and headed out. And after a brief conference in the pilot house, the uh, uh, Don Erickson, the master of the William Clay, uh, got the uh, William Clay Ford underway and headed out into the storm. And uh, according to the logbook of the William Clay Ford, uh, they went directly over the wreckage of the Fitzgerald, not knowing it. They uh, noticed crew members I've talked with uh, pointed out that they did see debris in the water. Uh, and uh, later on in the, in the morning, they, they saw an oil slick, which is never a good sign. And so they, uh, they went out there, but there was no sign of any uh, crew members that may have gotten off. The Coast Guard launched a search and rescue helicopter from the Traverse City area that flew up there with a rescue swimmer. But with waves 20, 30 feet high, uh, deploying the rescue swimmer is out of the question. Uh, they weren't able to, they wanted to contribute whatever they could to the uh, recovery of anyone that may have been in the water. So they dropped a series of illumination flares to light up the area in front of the two ships as they were heading out um, into the area that, uh, where the Fitz was last seen. And after expending all of their flares and get, getting uh, dangerously close to their um, uh, to their uh, fuel limits, they were able, to, they had to, were forced to re, uh, return to Driver City and um, shortly after landing, they ran out of fuel, so they cut it really close. But uh, there was never any sign of anyone that got off the ship. And this is the bell, bell of the, of the Fitzgerald. This is when it was recovered and uh, brought to the surface. It was replaced with a, uh, another bell uh, that was similar size and dimensions, but it had the names of all the crew members on it. And this was uh, a means uh, to bring closure to the families uh, who had no remains from their loved ones to bury. And uh, so they uh, put that, um, they had a, a, a diver in a mechanical dive suit that lowered himself that was lowered over the wreckage and he had a cutting torch and he cut the stanchions from the, uh, of this bell and that was brought to the surface. And then another bell, the replacement bell came down and was placed securely in, in position. And that's uh, remains on the bottom at this point. Now here's the bell in the original condition with the patina uh, from being underwater. You know, um, extended period of time. But that's, this isn't the condition you're going to see the bell when you, if, if you, go, you go up to the, uh, the museum up there at Whitefish Point. It's highly polished. And that's controversial. I, I, I believe it should have been left like this. But uh, that's no matter. It's, it's nice and shiny now. This is a, a, a list of all the uh, all 29 crew members have lost their lives on the Fitzgerald. And at the top is uh, Captain Ernest McSorley, who's the master of the, uh, of the Fitzgerald. And uh, there was even a crew member on board who was an apprentice pretty much. He was on his like first or second year. So he didn't have that much experience, but uh, uh, he's missing as well. Well, we'll leave it now over to a question and answer. And uh, Maggie would be, uh, we'll take your questions and uh, just, uh, I'll do my best to, to get you an answer. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, Steve, we've got one. It says, I've never seen photos of the Fitzgerald's interior, cabins, galley, pilot house, etc. Is there anywhere to see these? And were there guest rooms for passengers like some of the freighters have today in the, in the Fitzgerald? Well, that particular night, no, there were no uh, passengers on board the ship. Um, and uh, it was all business. 
Um, and in the forward section of the ship, uh, is, that's where the ship's officers' quarters are, the captain and the first mate, second mate, and third mate, and chief engineer, their quarters are, are over there. And um, there's also accommodations for guests, uh, or it's really quite opulent, really, really quite nice. But this, that particular night, there weren't any. Uh, and there's no one was able to get inside there, so there's no photographs of the inside of the ship. Do they have any when it was built or anything like that? Anybody take pictures? Uh, so this person wanted to know, is there any books or, you know, have you seen pictures of what the inside would have looked like before anything happened? Uh, there may be. I'd have to take a closer look at that and see if I can locate anything like that. And I, I'll, um, I'll be back at the museum on Friday, but I, I will take a look. There, uh, you know, the, during construction, um, I'm sure, like I showed that one picture of the, the boat and uh, being built, um, there may have been some photographs taken of the interior, but I'm, I'm not really sure. At this point, I can't recall seeing anything. Okay, um, someone said you mentioned earlier when the Anderson passes the Great Lakes Ship Museum, it sounds three long and two short blasts. Is there a special significance to this type of combination of horn blasts? Well, that's called the uh, the master salute, and uh, and and although uh, Cooper is no longer, uh, he's long retired, and I, I don't really think he's he may have passed on already. But it's a tradition um, on board the Anderson that uh, I mean that. The loss of the Fitzgerald is like a pinnacle uh, event in, in Great Lakes shipping. And uh, the Anderson is the only survivor of that, you know, at this point. Um, and every time she comes by, you know, this is one way of honoring all the, uh, the crew members of uh, both ships that uh, participated in that particular event. So it's called the Master Salute. Uh, another person asks, what role do you think the hatches had in the sinking? Well, the Coast Guard put together an inquiry and um, they were trying to pinpoint what happened also and it, everything's inconclusive and, and being able to see the, the damage that you know, was visible on, on the wreckage of the Fitzgerald is very difficult to be able to pinpoint exact cause, but they had some concerns about the hatch covers being uh, adequately uh, secured. There's uh, 21 hatch covers, as I pointed out, and each hatch cover has 64 hatch cover clamps that hold that down. Inside that hatch cover, there's a, a gasket all the way around the inside so that it provides a watertight seal. Uh, which in this particular case would prevent water from getting into the cargo holds. And um, the Coast Guard noted that uh, well, it was their, their belief that the hatch covers hadn't been secured. And when you get what they call that green water, when the waves come directly over the midship section of the ship and pound down, that's, that's a tremendous amount of weight. And um, th these hatch covers are designed to withstand that and not cave in. But uh, the Coast Guard, that was, they were looking at the hatch covers in the, in the forward, first five hatch covers in the forward section of the ship. And um, they, were, they were hinted around that uh, the crew may not have secured those. And uh, everyone who knows uh, McSorley and knows the, uh, the crew members on board the boat. And yeah, it's, it's a, a very strong belief that they don't take shortcuts. Uh, and they, that it was adequately secured. But by the boat twisting and turning and buckling uh, in the storm, it's quite possible it could have uh, weakened uh, some of the hatch covers. There was some other noted damage to the, uh, the ship by the storm. And um, but adequately, you know, of course, no one's going to go out on deck and try to identify anything that's gone wrong with it. So you'll never see that person again. They'll be gone and that's it. So um, there's a lot of question marks here, and it's just uh, 
I hate to do this to people, but you know, there's a lot of things we just don't know about what happened that night. But uh, um, I, my feeling is that the hash covers had were secured, and uh, um, from what I was under understand, what I've been told, that everyone feels the same way that the hash covers, the crew, of course, secured the ship uh, and and was ready to sail, and they were well aware of the conditions that they were about to go into. So. Okay, we have another um, question. Uh, thank you for the talk tonight. So the captain said they were holding their own that night, but if he had said they were in trouble, was there anything the Anderson could have done to save the lives? Uh, that's a good, that's a very good question because is uh, what could anyone have, have gotten uh, into the boat, you just you just couldn't take a ship that size and just turn around and circle around again. You uh, very well could could capsize, and and that's that's a, a possibility. Uh, I talked with crew members who from the William Clay that went out on that were that on the board the ship that night and had gone out, and a lot of them were expressed concern as a, if they did see someone, how would they get them out. Uh, it's, you just can't maneuver a, a boat that size um, in the waters that were that violent and uh, pick someone up right away. Um, even the Coast Guard helicopter realized, you know, the crew realized that they were in a very tight position too. So I don't know how they would have done it. It would have been interesting to see them try, but uh, as you know, it wasn't necessary. Uh, no one was ever found. Another question is, uh, how similar is the Fitzgerald to the ship anchored at the Sioux St. Marie? I'm not sure. Uh, they're, they're, they're very different. They're, I mean, they have a, the, you know, there's that standard style, you know, where the, the engine room's in the rear and, and the pilot house in the, on the bow and the well, hatch covers in the middle there, cargo hold in the, in the midship section, but that's about where it ends. Um, uh, a very good idea of what the pilot house uh, for, would look like is if by visiting the Dawson Great Lakes Museum, because the uh, when the uh, Fitzgerald was built, it was hall number 300, 301, and built in 1957 and launched in 58. The William Clay Ford was built at Great Lakes Engineering 2, and it was hall number 300. It was built just before the Fitzgerald, but that was in 1953. And um, uh, so the, the pilot house would have been very similar, just five years difference. And uh, you get a good idea by walking in there what it would have looked like. Uh, of course, the uh, William Clay was, was smaller, it was 647 feet when it was launched. And when it went out of service, it was, uh, 767. It, it was at a 120 foot extension and uh, added in 1979, uh, four years after the Fitzgerald was launched. But uh, uh, there, there, I guess the the Fitzgerald, the uh, William Clay would uh, give you an idea what the Fitzgerald looked like. But the uh, the Valley Camp uh, doesn't look. I mean, it's an old, much older boat, much older, early uh, 1900s. We have another question. Um, do they still ring the bells 29 times at the Mariners Church in Detroit every year? Yes, they do. And um, it's, um, they, it's, it's uh, the Mariners Church, of course, it's uh, that's pretty close to downtown Detroit where the uh, Windsor Tunnel is pretty close in that area there. It's easy not to see it. <laughs> Because it's surrounded by uh, by much uh, taller buildings, but there is a very small uh, ceremony, a, a very uh, a small. By I mean, it's a uh, the the people who attended are are on invitation only. It's not no standing room or anything like that. But it's uh, a very somber um, uh, religious ceremony honoring those that lost their lives. Uh, that's always happens on the very morning of uh, November 10th, uh, 19, uh, and, and whereas the, uh, on the Dawson Great Lakes Museum, 
every November 10th in the evening, we have a much larger uh, ceremony, but it's, it's called Lost Mariners Remembrance. And what that means is that uh, they use the, uh, the anniversary of the Fitzgerald, because that's obviously something that most people are gonna remember, but it honors instead all estimated 30,000 mariners who have lost their lives on the Great Lakes. And uh, not just those from the Fitzgerald, but all 30,000. And um, there's uh, lanterns lit around the uh, anchor of the Fitzgerald anchor and uh, 29 uh, lanterns, but there's another one that's just uh, for all those others that had lost their lives. And uh, it's normally well attended. There's a ceremony where a wreath with uh, uh, 30 roses on it is handed off and placed to a Coast Guard uh, boat that slowly takes it out uh, to the mid channel and then places it in the water. Uh, quite a very somber and very, uh, very uh, um, solemn ceremony. But uh, this year, Things are a little different, you know, it's uh, everything in 2020 is different. So we had a, uh, this was last Tuesday, a week ago, and we had a, uh, uh, a virtual ceremony where we had uh, a, a broadcast from the anchor and then representatives from the uh, merchant uh, uh, community were there, were present, and as well as the commander of the uh, local uh, department of the uh, Coast Guard was also present. We had uh, the, both fire boats, there's new, the, the new one and the uh, Curtis Randolph, the fire boats were there, J.W. Westcott, the mail boat was there, as well as Coast Guard representations. But um, yeah, there's, uh, we, we, we don't ring a bell at, uh, well, we normally do uh, 29 times for all members of the, uh, of the crew, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a, a smaller number of people nowadays that have uh, been around since the, the loss of the Fitzgerald, 45 years. But on a, on a positive note, a, an opportunity to, to stress the positive things, we have not lost a ship since the Fitzgerald was gone. I think that may be the uh, one of the largest, if not the largest span of time, uh, we're on the Great Lakes, we have not lost a ship. And Here's a question that said, how likely is it that there, there could be another event like the Fitzgerald or do ships of this size and shape not navigate during bad weather? And another thing I could add to that question is the technology better, that they can really study it and know more or what? Well, um, no one knows what, uh, there was a lot of failures, uh, a series of, of unfortunate events that took place that night. First of all was the, uh, that being the, the radar on the Fitzgerald uh, being inoperable and uh, navigation errors. You know, it's like one thing led to another that contributed to another that contributed to another. And uh, there's a lot of redundant systems on the ships uh, such as uh, uh, compasses and navigation aids, as well as radar. And, and we have this beautiful thing called a G global positioning system, GPS, that uh, helps identify things. Every boat now has a transponder on it, AIS transponder. And what that does is there's, you can look on a chart and you can actually see, electronic charts, you can actually see where the ships are. And uh, there's, uh, redundant systems that can help with uh, communications. So there's, a, there's a lot of things that uh, makes it a, a lot much, is a different situation than existed back in 1975. And um, will another ship run into mishaps? I don't know. You know, at this particular time, you know, it's been 45 years and uh, the boats have been going through the same storms. The storms haven't gotten any lighter. You know, they're, uh, they're just as violent as ever out there. And uh, we have crews that still sail those, uh, those waters and uh, both saltwater boats and uh, mostly freshwater boats, lake boats. And um, they make it, they, uh, they don't take unnecessary risks. Um, 
their job is to move cargo and uh, that's what they do. If uh, conditions are going to jeopardize the, the ship and the crew, uh, they won't take those chances. And it's very safe out there. Well, it's safer, you know, it's, you still have to pay attention to what you're doing and not be complacent, but uh, it's a, it's a di much different world out there now than it was out there in 75. We have another question. Do you know the height of the largest waves recorded on Superior? Is it 20 to 30 uh, feet considering the stream or more average for a November storm? Do they know what the tallest one would have been? Um, I, the range of 20, 30 is, is about standard uh, at the height of the storm season. And you get strong winds blowing across the uh, across the lake, and you're you're going to get big waves like that. Um, I have no idea what the, what the largest wave on the Lake Superior would have been, but uh, you know it's it's these winds. Like uh, anyone who sailed, uh, is, you know, as a sailor and has gone down uh, the Detroit River into Lake Erie, which is very very shallow, and because of its shallow uh, nature winds coming from west to east there's nothing to the west that's going to break the uh the speed of these way uh the winds blowing across uh from west to east and and you can be out there on, on lake erie and you could be there with uh, uh three foot seas which is very manageable and then you know half hour later you're dealing with eight to twelve maybe 15 foot seas and it's time to go home <laughs> at that point you know, time to get out of there. It's more than a lot of sailors can can handle. So, but, uh, someone, very, uh, very tricky. Someone asked another question. Um, what is the bell made out of? Is it like grass? Grass. grass. It's right. cast grass. Yes, it is. How heavy do you think that might be? Um, hundreds of pounds. I know. I've uh, at the Dawson Great Lakes Museum. We have bells from other ships. Uh, probably comparable size and I can't move them. So they're, you know, several hundred pounds easily. Okay, I have another question. Was there a ship called the Montrose that flipped on its side and was struck under the Ambassador Bridge or the Blue Water Bridge? You know uh, it, it went, it, uh, actually when I was a kid, I'll tell you the story. The Montrose was a, uh, a, a it was an English ship. It was from, it uh, it was from England, the UK, and it was sailing down the Detroit River, and there was a tug pushing a barge up the river in the opposite direction. And uh, through a navigational error, the tug pushed the barge, and it hit the side, the port side of the uh, of the Montrose, and ripped a big hole into the side of the ship. And that was directly underneath the Ambassador Bridge. And that was in 1960, 64 or 66, one of those two. And um, I was a little kid and my father was watching 11 o'clock news or, you know, and you know, they, we interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin. And they told about a collision on the Detroit River. And uh, the Montrose was taking on water and they were trying to save the ship. And uh, so my dad, of course, says, hey, let's go. So he, hey, we got in the car, drove down there, and uh, uh, I was being a real small kid. He put me on his shoulders, and I'm, I'm watching. There's a, hundreds of people over there, a lot of big crowd, you know, uh, all of them experts on what they should do. And then the Montrose began to, to roll, and you hear this moaning sound, and that's the ship just kind of giving way. And I remember watching this, the Montrose just roll right over onto its side um, underneath. And there was a lot of controversy about the cargo and everything else, uh, you know, who has rights to the cargo. It, there, there, it, was, it, it, <laughs> it, was, it was, it was comical, but uh, they have succeeded in raising the Montrose. They didn't cut it up. They just raised it, were able to turn it, rotate it and pump the water out of it, seal the hole, and raise it. And they took it down to, I believe it was Toledo, in a dry dock area over there, and repair it. And then they gave it a new name, because first of all, no one's going to want a, a ship 
named the Montrose after the, everyone knows it sank. So they, they renamed it, I forget the name. And uh, she sailed for a while uh, under new colors and everything. So it wasn't, you know, it was an interesting uh, story. And I remember someone saying that uh, that night that they ought to put a block and tackle around the ambassador bridge and pull it up. <laughs> and then no way that would work. You pull down the ambassador bridge, but uh, everyone's an engineer there. So. Okay, are there any other questions? Anyone else have anything else they would like to ask Steve? Okay. Well, Steve, thank you for the wonderful presentation. I learned so much about it. I Very interesting. And being somebody that was born in Michigan, I, I found it very interesting. Um, Steve's well, hopefully we'll be coming back in April um, and doing his presentation on the end of World War II. What was that called again, Steve? Victory? Uh, Victory in Europe. Uh, it's the time span from uh, after the Battle of the Bulge, basically from January to May 1945. All those events that occurred and, and everything that, that transpired that eventually with the collapse of the Third Reich and uh, the Russians closing in on Berlin from the from the east and and crossing, breaching the Rhine River, crossing over and then uh, pushing deep into Central Europe. I don't want to give this story away. <laughs> right. And then um, maybe in the summer we'll have you back about the metals. Why don't you explain to the, um, the yes. people about that? Well, I uh, I, I, I collect uh, military stuff and I have a very large collection of American medals, uh, campaign and service medals and decorations um, that uh, I found really fascinating and having served in the army for 26 years, you know, I've become very familiar with the different ribbons that we wear on our uniforms. So we're on the left side, whether you're Navy, uh, Air Force, Marines or Army, these ribbons, some are the same and some are different. So some are are, are characteristic of a, of a certain uh, branch. And they tell something, there's a little story there, you know? And so by looking at these uh, ribbons, you can usually pinpoint what someone had done, where they had been, what they served, if they uh, were wounded or if they did anything extraordinary, you know, um, a lot of that would be uh, revealed by those ribbons. And so, my program in, uh, in the summer is gonna be about uh, American medals and decorations. It's called In Recognition of Valor and Service. And uh, learning the story behind uh, a lot of these medals and, uh, and decorations. And so that, you know, what they represent, what they mean and, and uh, story about their uh, coming about like Purple Heart, you know, the story behind the Purple Heart. And so this will be uh, something that, you know, if you have your uh, your grandfather's or your father's uh, medals in a drawer, I can probably help you figure out what these all mean, and and it helps with your appreciation and uh, of your uh, your your parents or grandparents' uh, service, and uh, and either you know Korea, World War II, Vietnam, global war on terrorism. You know, we've. Uh, a lot of these medals all mean the same thing. So there's a lot of uh, prestige associated with them, so. Well, okay, thanks Steve for everything and, and thank you all for coming. And if you could fill out the um, survey uh, when you close, uh, leave the Zoom, uh, we would really appreciate it. Thanks again and hope you can tune in again soon. Thank you. Okay, good night everybody. <laughs>